Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 to 18, in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain, because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guilty. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe and live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, please do keep your... Please keep a finger in there in Deuteronomy because there's actually a second reading I'm going to read today that should help us make sense of that one, which is in Matthew chapter 5, and if you've got a church Bible, that's page 969. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, 27 to 30, I'm just going to read. Jesus speaking, and he says, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Lord Jesus, who is the loving, most loving, most kind, most gracious person who has ever lived. And yet, about this topic we are talking about today gives us stark warning. And so we want to listen, and we pray your Spirit will be with us, bringing us to listen and understand and obey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into Deuteronomy 5, can I just say, if you don't usually come to our evening service, which is at our church centre, to Blackburn Place, this evening we're doing something called Ask an Elder, where two people who help lead the church are going to come and field any questions you've got to ask at all. Uh, I think they're good on like, world capitals. They're actually both very good on medicines. You can come with all your diseases. And, uh, not really. It's really questions about the Christian life or church life or a theological thing or an ethical thing you want to know about, maybe something we've talked about on Sunday morning. Do come along 6.15 to Blackburn Place. Now, recently I was discussing a particular ethical issue um, uh, that the church is debating at the moment with someone. And they basically said, oh, in our church we don't really talk about always talking about sex. Well, I'll be honest with you, that's not totally my experience. I mean, when we are like having coffee at the end of the service or whatever. <laughs> 
amount of media I consume, there's a lot more talk about that than there is in church. In my experience, yours may be different. But today is the day. Uh, we go through bits of the Bible. The Bible addresses our whole human experience. That means some days we're going to talk about sex. And God uh, lists it in one of his top ten commands. And so today is the day we're going to talk about it. To be honest, this is not a comfortable field. I'm a political liberal at heart, and I feel people should be able to make their own private decisions about what they do in life. That's my instinct. And so we're not a church that preaches family values or gets involved in political campaigning. And yet, I am challenged to see hearing right in the middle of everybody's personal lives that what two people do in the privacy of a bedroom is nobody else's business. Thinks it is. From verse 17 onwards, they're more about how God and the Lord fifth commandment. But just remember the, the New Testament says the law is given to lead us to Jesus. That is, as soon as we read these commandments, many of us become aware of how we've broken them. And that feeling probably intensifies as we go down through the commandments. So as we go down through murder, adultery, theft, lying and envying, by the time we get to the bottom of that list, everybody will feel challenged just by reading it. We're sort of in the awkward middle section at the moment where I guess there are some people feeling a bit uncomfortable and some people feeling a bit safe and self-righteous. You know, like, ha, finally, one I've kept. Phew. Well, as we go through in a journey with this commandment, I'm going to say we're all going to feel uncomfortable on the journey, but I hope we're all going to feel greatly soothed and helped by the end. So whether you're feeling superior, whether you're feeling incredibly guilty, or just mildly interested, sit tight. We live in a world where nearly everything that Christians have always believed about sex is totally bonkers to most people. Fortunate word, maybe. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, as a pastor, I deal day to day mostly with Christians who come and ask me about things to do with life. And I think even today, Christians find it hard to believe what God is asking them to do because it is so utterly different from what we are told and soaked in all the time. But here is the headline. To you from God so that you can reflect what he is like with your body. And sex is mainly about that. It's a chance to image God. It is not, as we're constantly told, about having a desire that you have a right to have fulfilled, a right to pursue. God's view is that faithfulness to God and to your spouse and to your community is much more important than satisfaction. Now, in a sense, it is a false line. Faithful sex in a place of trust and intimacy is often satisfying, and sometimes for one person and sometimes for another and sometimes for both people. But whatever's going on there, faithfulness still comes first. Action. The underlying thought is like, no, no, no. You couldn't be expected to live without sexual satisfaction. That's the underlying and commands you to use your body to express the faithfulness of God to the world. If you think sexual desire is something I have that I ought to have fulfilled, you will not, with your body, be imaging God <coughs> and displaying what he is like to everybody else. It is actually as simple as that little kid's talk that I did. Everybody got, even little kids, it's interesting writing a kid's talk in this topic, you'll see I cleverly saw that. that is the way you should treat others. Even little kids get that. And the message of the Bible is God has treated us with absolute faithfulness. And so that is the way we should be to other people. Now that rules in and rules out a whole lot of sexual behaviour. Here in the list of these ten words to live by, he particularly zooms in on adultery. That is, 
being married and having sex with someone you're not married to, or having sex with someone, that murder is exposing the danger of a life guided by anger and vengeance. He says the command against adultery exposes the danger of a life guided by the desire for sex. It's about much more than that. It's about the desire to use someone else for your fulfilment. And that is the opposite of what God does. But that strong desire could drag you away from him. So here's the first thing we see. Faithfulness for the community. I am treading carefully here. If this makes you feel uncomfortable, sit through it. We will get to something hopeful. But here is the truth. When someone commits adultery, or even they're not married, but they're in a relationship and someone cheats, undoubtedly, their spouse receives most of the pain, and then their children, if they have any. But actually, when someone does that, it rebounds right into the whole community that surrounds that family unit. New Year's Eve together every year, and then it turned out the two people within that group were having an affair with each other. And everyone's friendships were ruined. I'm not sure the people involved in the affair cared that much. They were too busy clearing up the damage in their own family. What people do about sex affects everybody around them. It's illegal. Uh, I think it's different law and God's people are not a nation. But interestingly, if you read the rest of the law, men and women alike were to be held responsible. Men and women were both called to faithfulness. They were both seen as moral beings who make responsible choices, whether they're rich or poor. And that was not true in the society they came from. They were slaves. So in most societies in the world, there is some deeply embedded idea that adultery is not good. In the ancient world, where the king was basically God and power went down from him through men, in a patriarchal society. What that you are standard, and women of all sorts are expected to be totally pure, whilst also having to submit to the wishes of impure men somehow. These commandments, the whole community, in these are severe for both parties. That's echoed in the New Testament. There's a story where they catch some religious leaders, catch a woman caught in adultery. I mean, that's a strange phrase by itself, isn't it? A woman caught in adultery. There must have been someone else present, but he doesn't appear in the story. So this thing that men can get away with it and women can't, it, it survived this law being given, but it was there in the law. Men and women both take moral responsibility. And it's echoed in the New Testament because that basically in the New Testament introduces the whole concept of consent by saying a husband and wife should treat each other's bodies with the respect that they treat their own. Husbands too were giving their bodies into someone else's care in marriage, not just women doing that to men. Women too have a claim to hide the body of their spouse. So all married people are called to faithfulness under the law. Community is much more important than satisfaction for you. Now, the truth is that sex is private. Seriously, nobody wants to have that chat over coffee today. I'm not suggesting it. No one wants to interfere in that personal, deeply personal, private part of your life. If that is causing you issues, that's okay. But when you have sex with or try to have sex with someone you're not supposed to, that affects the community that you're in. Sign up to this when they're sitting in the talk listening to the sermon. Oh yes, faithfulness, really good idea. Society should be faithful. But when there are very strong feelings, uh, I've had mature Christian men sit in my office opposite to me Basically saying, yes, I know what you're saying. But in this case, my sexual desire matters more than the value of faithfulness to the people around me, my wife, my children, my church. I'm a special case. And uh, on some occasions, if they did go off and have sex with someone else, it was true that all the rest of us picked up the pieces. And that community, the one in Deuteronomy, and this community... 
here should have been safe from that, use power to gain sexual control over women. But that should not be. It's wrong. We should be safe from that. It's why particularly the New Testament talks about an adulterer who is continual and not repentant should be put out of the church. Or if I just decide to behave in some immoral way outside of church then, well that won't have effect on anyone else's walk with God. But I've lived long enough to see a number of people who did things they thought were wrong and they later came to the conclusion, why did I do that? And they just realised they had always assumed it was okay because they saw an older Christian doing it. So we are all connected to each other. What about those most private of sins? Porn usage. Well, that seems private, but it really does affect the community of the world a lot because the vast majority of porn is made by trafficked people. And the more that you feed a life where you desire something and so you get it, you're becoming the type of that destroys people trafficking happen for the sake of your desire. So faithfulness is for the sake of the community. Here's the second thing we see. Faithfulness over feelings. This is the second reading we had in Matthew 5. Jesus t- is talking about this and he says, When you even look at someone lustfully, you have committed adultery in your heart. Strange phrase, isn't it? We sort of say about these things, well, it takes two to tango. Apparently not. How can you be committing adultery with someone if it's... I have done this. Have I been... What he's saying is this, when you lust after someone, that is when you look at someone for your own sexual or emotional kicks, in you, the thing that leads to adultery, in you, that thing is already born. We tend to... And Jesus is saying, no, listen, whether you end up committing adultery with that person or not, and in the vast number of cases you don't, that's no cause for self-congratulation. The heart problem is still in you that you think other people exist for your pleasure. And it's still in there, you, alive and kicking and dangerous. And so Jesus says, instead of thinking, oh, well, at least I didn't sleep with that married person. Well done, me. He says, take radical action to cut out that attitude. Because that is the attitude that in the end, You see, lust, wanting other people's bodies for our pleasure, is anti-gospel. You can't believe, you can't have faith in the things that Jesus teaches indefinitely and also believe it's okay to use other people for your pleasure. If you believe that, you don't trust the things that Jesus says. And if you don't trust Jesus, he says you will go to hell. And he gives the same warning about anger because they're both incredibly powerful forces. Society says, let your anger out. And it's like that little shop of horrors. Away from believing what Jesus says about people. And you will, he says, end up living life to satisfy that lust, which means not trusting Jesus at all. There are lots who made that decision, who I've known, who decided that satisfying their lust was more important to faithfulness, to Jesus and to the church. Me, other How does this fit with being a Christian, being unfaithful? It's interesting the sidestep people make, even very mature Christians, they say, oh, well, maybe I'm not a Christian. You see, isn't that what Jesus says in Matthew 5? Now, lots of people do it and come back to the Lord and we hope and pray for that and we will all help them fix the almighty mess they've caused for themselves and everyone else. Repentance is always a possibility no matter how far away you wander. But people who let their desire for sex control their lives are not usually the type of people who are going to turn back and look for satisfaction in Jesus in the end. Lust for sex will overpower your faith and love for Jesus. 
And if that's you, in any way risking that, Jesus, who is the kindest person who ever lived, gives the threat that he doesn't use loads, actually, but he says the Christian. I mean, Matthew 5 is addressed to professing Christians. It's particularly bad to do this if you do this as a Christian because you're telling lies with your body about God to the world. There is a world out there hungry for faithfulness. It's particularly serious when someone who is supposed to be bringing light to the world behaves in that, that way. And so Jesus says, listen, it's just better to cut out. Given the danger of all sexual sin, though, why does adultery get a special mention? <clears throat> it's not like the other things the law rules out are unimportant. Sex with someone of the same sex, sex outside of marriage, those are both repeated in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Why the particular mention of adultery, cheating on a marriage? It's partly to do with the destructive social effects. There are plenty of people who've been cheated on by someone they weren't married to, though, and that's a very destructive thing, too. So why talk at this high level? <clears throat> the Bible teaches us, right from the very beginning, from the first page, that our bodies are made to tell and read it to us, he described this relationship as a covenant, which is a word for It's hard to understand God, isn't it? I can stand up here and say words like God loves you and salvation and righteousness and all that stuff. It all feels a relationship. Or he wants all that he has to be yours. He wants to take on to himself any wrongness and pain and problems you bring to the relationship. He wants to enjoy knowing you and hearing your voice each day. And he even wants you to open up the most fragile, private parts of yourself up to him and receive love and grace and care. In short, what he wants with you is something like a marriage. It's the wrong way around, actually. It's not quite right. It's actually this way around. Every marriage you see, even at its best, is just a faint echo of how God wants to love you. Every command about sex isn't arbitrary. People are in body and how it is used. People should encounter God's character. And so behaviours that are outside God's description of his love for his people are publishing lies about God is the whole story and that means faithfulness is beautiful whether that's faithfulness in marriage which can be there to the world that there is a truth about a God who is faithful the spirit fills you God's presence is brought to a dark world if you walk in faithfulness you are shy, especially about all of this stuff that we're talking about It is worth thinking, though, about how that story, the story of God's covenant with these people, panned out. Here is the short episode. meant leaving the God who had rescued and loved them and brought them out of slavery. It was a broken and dead marriage because one partner wouldn't go back and was determined to follow their own desires rather than live for faithfulness. And at the end of the Old Testament, many times, God says, guys, we're divorced. Right down there in the very last remnants of what came out of that marriage between God and these people was born a baby. And as he got older, he went around saying things like, I'm the bridegroom. He didn't have any bride. Even though it was a wedding feast. And I'm the bridegroom. And so when Jesus died and came back to life, his offer is to dress any person, no matter how dirty and rebellious, whether you have been used or you are the user, to clothe them in white, to make them part of his spotless bride through that gift. Now, becoming a Christian... It works very like a marriage. 
uh, if you're married here. I wonder if you came to your marriage with loads of debt. Well, do you know your spouse is not liable for that debt? That's how marriage works. It passes to them too. Or maybe you came to your marriage with loads of money. Well, spouse gets to use that money now. It belongs to them too. And the picture of this marriage is that we all come to Jesus with a debt of mess, of sexual sin, of lusts that we haven't and can't control, hurts we've caused to are very uncomfortable. And that's why we eat bread and drink wine, not just his rightness and goodness. And he says, I'm the husband who wants to give it. That's the big story. I think that also for your personal story, whatever it is. You may be living in the wreckage caused by unfaithfulness, yourselves or yourself or someone else's. And remember in the wreckage of that unfaithfulness in the Bible, God redeemed it and made something better and more beautiful by sending Jesus. We wouldn't have had the beautiful story without the tragedy of Israel's failure. And the promise in Jesus is to bring even your terrible, worst mistakes to the table and to use them for good. That is what happens at his wedding feast. At the table we're going to gather around, he says, bring your worst and I will redeem it. Faithfulness is a beautiful calling for someone who knows a faithful God. But it's not just a simple, God is faithful and we copy him. It's we bring our unfaithfulness to Jesus, the faithful one, and as he takes that and swaps it for his faithfulness and righteousness, we can begin to mirror back out into the world, to publish to the world, the truth about faithful God.